Hey, <clears throat> hey, I'm in the bathtub again with my, uh, my Kimber. Let me introduce my Kimber. I call this Kimber King, K and K, you know what I'm saying? You see, I have a little safety, huh? <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> I'm just in a good old John Browning design. Yeah, I'm so proud of my 1911. <laughs> I didn't think I would be, but I, I just like once I got it, it's like wow, <laughs> so awesome. Anyway, <clears throat> get all comfortable in the tub. You know, <clears throat> there's no water in here. I don't want to like mess up my, you know, my my shit. Anyway, I want to talk about um, the difference between um, commercial and artistic art, as it were. Okay. And I'm not saying this because it's it's a news flash or anything like that. I'm saying it because I've come to the impression that, like, you know, a lot of you just don't understand this, okay? I mean, so I'm trying to introduce a new idea to you. It's not a new idea. It's a new idea for you. And, and I don't mean to be, like, an asshole like that, I'm just saying, okay? Because some of you probably have heard of this idea. But for those of you who haven't, it's going to be a new idea. So the idea is, like, um... <clears throat> You know, if you look at, you know, most, like, you know, artists, if they're going to be successful today in 2017, it's because they're, they're fitting the mold and their work is commercial. So in order to profit from your work, you see, you have to find some way for people to buy it, okay? And, and then people who, like, you know, are inundated by advertising and magazines all through, you know, their lives from childhood up to old age, you know, Vanity Fair and just everything, you know. Their, what they see becomes symbolic of a social status. So what you see is not just beauty. It's beauty, but it's beauty coupled usually with social status. So, you know, you don't see some, you don't see like, you know, um, you know, like just a roly poly, you know, plain salt of the earth woman on the cover on the cover of like Vanity Fair. You see someone who's only going to look the way they look on Vanity Fair if they're rich. Okay, I mean, I know because I'm a photographer, and you don't look like that normally. Okay, you look like that after you've had a rich lifestyle and you've had a rich, you know, you know, clothes and you're pampered rich and you're pampered day after day with skin creams and with. You know, I mean, I'm serious, okay? You, you take your vitamins to make sure your complexion's proper. You know, showers once or twice every day. Hairstylists, you know. I mean, it just goes on, you know, two hours before coming out of the set, okay? You don't see anything real, okay? And it's not, you know, that's fine. I mean, you know, whatever. But what I'm trying to say is, is that what you see is beautiful, but beauty is only one of eight, okay, different criteria One's what they're trying to sell you, one's what's expected, one's what's socially appropriate, one's what's supposed to fool you into thinking it's somehow cutting edge and today, and, you know, on and on, okay? They, you know, they get maybe one look per decade, okay? Instead of having, like, an artist or a group of artists who might bring you six or seven different looks in one year, like Picasso and, and you know, Quattro Gats and all this stuff, you know, what they do is they get one look and then they all get in sync, sort of like radio stations, how you, you know, you flip through radio stations when it comes to a commercial break, they're all on the same commercial break at the same time, sort of like they're in lockstep. That's what they're doing, okay? It's it's very, very orchestrated. It's not spontaneous at all. If something spontaneous did happen, they'd get rid of it. I mean, it's the same thing in writing journalism. I was on this panel of, like, some of the best writers for the LA Times. Not me, but I was visiting, you know, one of the attendees in the audience for the panel. And they were giving us poor schmoes, you know, just like, you know... You know, like, what can you do to improve your, your work? And one of them said, like, his pet peeve was the writer who occasionally, when writing an article, had a moment of brilliance that came up with just this really cool, catchy phrase or some very clear insight or descriptive phrase into what was going on. And the first thing editors will do when they come upon that in a story is erase it. Because after all, unless your entire article was equally as brilliant, if you just have one moment of excellence that disturbs the you know, conformity and continuity of your work, and now that has to be erased. So the one good thing you did artistically is gone because that just gets in the way of the business model of what we're trying to do. Okay, and that's great. So what I'm trying to say is like, you know, 
that's commercial art. See, what I consider commercial art is craftsmanship, okay? It's all about craftsmanship. I mean, you know, like one time I was photographing a woman in hard, harsh sunlight with a waterfall behind her. She had just long hair. She had these sort of Italian features, and I was seeing it in black and white, okay? It's one of the best black and whites I've ever done. And she went off to the restroom to do some, you know, touch up for a second. And I'm sitting there by myself, and this guy comes up to me with his kids, and he says, I saw you out there photographing, huh? I said, yeah. He says, well, I have news for you, bub. You're photographing, you're in harsh lighting. How's that going to come out? I said, it's coming out like I want it to. She says, sure it is. You don't fool me. I'm a wedding photographer full time. Get her in some shade and, you know, try again. And then he walked off. So that's what I mean. He was a craftsman, you see, okay? And I'm sure he'd get great shots at that nine out of ten people when they saw those shots would like them and want them more than maybe what I got, which was excellent, but different, okay? And I'm, you know, I'm not gonna like do a YouTube thing, oh, I'll show you the shot yourself or some shit like that, okay? But I'm just telling you that he took it upon himself to butt in on something that was none of his business and he had nothing to do with to tell me that because he was threatened by something, wasn't he? This is LA, you don't just fuck around, oh, here's a kid taking a picture, you must have, something must have been happening, okay? So anyway, that put down, you know, I'm just saying that, um, you know, they, there's a big difference. And, and the people who are like, you know, craftsmen get really, really get their panties in a wad when you don't do what the manual tells you to do when you're constructing your craft, okay? And, and craftsmanship is difficult. It's hard to be a good craftsman. It takes a lot of work and discipline to be a good craftsman. They have these real standards built up, and that's great. But if you're an artist... Okay, if you're an artist, you don't need to do any of that. You're free, free, free to have fun, free to play, free to explore, free to express yourself, free not to do the right thing, free to do what, what you know, say the message that moves you, free to have a spontaneous moment, free to make a discovery like, wow, look what this did when I took this shot, wow. <clears throat> You're free to, that the whole world becomes a playground, you know, and, and you can say all these wonderful things, you know, and, but you can't do that as a craftsman. As a craftsman, you have to hammer the mold out and it's all judged into details. Like, did you do the sandpapering enough? Did you sandpaper with the grain or against the grain? Okay. Did you, did you apply the staining? Did you apply the primer before you applied the stainer? Okay. And it's really strange. It's like, you know, I just spilled varnish on it and it made all these loops on it and I think it looks awesome. And just a look of horror, like, <gasps> You know, and it doesn't matter if you put it out there. I'm like, you know, you do see, you know, that they're just going to be, ah! Okay, but that's what I mean. As the artist, you see, you have the opportunity to, like, you know, take all the skills of the craftsman and create something a craftsman never could, okay? So that's what's neat about the artist. And it's like, let me give you another example, like Miles Davis. Miles Davis is an artist, okay? He's an artist. Okay, you want to know some of the signs? Well, for one thing, he has 50 albums, okay? He must have over... 10,000 tracks, all right? He's been all over the world, and you want to know what? Every one of those songs, they're different. They're not the same. They're completely different. Every one of them is like, wow, that's a unique composition. It isn't just like the last thing you did. How did you do that? And you want to know why? He wasn't superhuman. He was uninhibited. That's why he was uninhibited, okay? I mean, they were And what's more is that for whatever weird reason, they decided to accept him at that one moment in time. If he did that again today, they wouldn't know who he was or what to do with him. They'd be giving him DPSS over there. Oh, you should get food stamps, Miles. And, you know, it's, it's you know, it's not any different. You know, I mean, he, if he had been 200 years earlier in the time of classical music, no one would have given a fuck about Miles Davis. All right, so it was all timing. It had nothing to do with who he was. But anyway, that aside, you know, he was this great artist because when he plays his music, all right, it isn't all just happy, happy, joy, joy, happy, happy, joy, joy. Sometimes he sounds pretty bummed when he plays his music. He sounds full of angst. He sounds world weary. He sounds like he's in pain and he looks sad, all right? And you see his pictures? I never saw a happy picture of Miles Davis, okay? Hi, I'm Miles! No, <clears throat> all right? 
and it's beautiful okay even if it's not traditionally beautiful like this isn't what a pop hit sounds like in 19 whatever it tells you that he was alive all right he was feeling he was expressing and everything he sounds is different okay everything is a different feeling to it and you know it's him and there's never going to be anyone else like him so that's what I think about Miles Davis. Then we can take someone else, like Les McCann, okay? I like Les McCann, but his music is all about drive, okay? It's like do 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 okay? And that's great. I love drive. I love rock, okay? But the point is, is that if you do a search online to try to find this music on YouTube so you can just listen to it being poor and penniless and trying to find something to distract you from, you know, you know, then what you do is that you'll find that Miles Davis is everywhere and Les McCann is nowhere. And you want to know why? Because Les McCann, I guess, polices the copyright on his music because he doesn't want to be gypped out of his money. Okay, and I understand that. I totally get that. I'm all for that. But you see, you can hear the difference in the music, you see, because one place we're going do, 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 and the other place we're flying, we're floating, we're drifting in the clouds, we're coming down to earth here and talking about this feeling here, we're coming down to earth here and talking about what was felt here. I know you think it's gay because you're a commercial you know, artist. But if you're not a commercial artist, then the whole world is like this playground of sounds and whispers that all lead to these stories and vistas that no one else ever sees, okay? And, you know, it's reflected in the art, it's reflected in the music. So if you're the capitalistic, you know, you know, sort of the more of the craftsman who's going to tailor his art toward commercialism, because what's he doing that Les McCann? He's getting your attention. Strong beat, strong drive, no message, no melody really compared to Miles Davis. It's like do 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 you know, very short, not longer than three minutes, you know. And it's like, yeah, okay, so he crafted it the cell. Okay? It's not an ex it's not a spontaneous creation. It's not a creation. It's a construct to sell. Okay? And you can tell it's a construct to sell because he's selling it. Okay? <laughs> all right? I mean, Miles Davis, you know, yeah, he sold it, but he wasn't out there being a bitch about it. All right? <laughs> okay? You know, I mean, it's like the Smashing Pumpkins. Billy Gorgon gave, like, you know, Pisces a scary out, or maybe, no, it was the second machine, Machina, the Machines of God 2. He just put that out on the internet for free and let people download it because you know why? He said, I have billions of dollars. I'd rather people just listen to my music. I I don't need any more money and so he just put it out like that and you know i talked to some guy who was a fan of his and he says i can't believe he did it he turned and he spit on the ground i can't believe that asshole just put out his work for free <laughs> that's what i think of that what an insult to us okay well that's what i mean you see most of you guys are craftsmen and some of us are artists